Hello. It's so nice to have you all here this afternoon. Never know what's going to happen when it rains out. Um, my goal here today is to tell the story of how, on the town. <clears throat> Not only tell the story of how it was created, but illustrate how it was created through the items in our collections. Um, we'll talk about the musical's significance, um, <clears throat> how ideas changed and developed, and we'll take a look at just a couple of the um, some of the cut songs and lyrics. So this collaboration started with um, this group. It had its roots back in 1937 when Bernstein first met Adolf Green at Camp Onotu, and they immediately hit it off. The following year, Green met Betty Comden, and they, along with a few others, formed the satirical group The Reviewers, which you may have heard of. And Bernstein would occasionally accompany their group on piano. Leonard Bernstein and Jerome Robbins met in uh, late in 1943, and they collaborated on the ballet Fancy Free. And it was a smashing success. Oliver Smith, the set designer for the ballet, soon approached them about expanding the concept of Fancy Free into a, a full-length Broadway musical. And he offered to produce it with his friend, Paul Feige. Bernstein insisted that Comden and Green were the perfect pair to write the book. Um, I think Jerome Robbins wanted John Latouche and um, Arthur Lawrence. <clears throat> But once they saw a reviewer's performance, Smith and Feige agreed. And then they aimed for the top in seeking a director and were able to procure the stage veteran George Abbott. And once Abbott's name was attached, they were able to raise the additional funds that they needed, more than they needed. And On the Town became the first ever musical to sell the film rights before it even went to Broadway. Um, <clears throat> I think On the Town is often overlooked because it's not West Side Story. Um, there was no cast recording right away, so there's no, um, you know, nothing for people to take home. And then it was uh, eclipsed by the film. The film came out only a few years later, and that um, had a lot of music in it that wasn't Bernstein's. <clears throat> and then also, you know, it was a very topical musical, and the war ended and we wanted to move on. And so <clears throat> I think it's just uh, been a little overlooked, but I find it endlessly fascinating. First of all, because it was all of these, what we now think of as titans of the musical theater stage, getting their feet wet for the very first time. This was Leonard Bernstein's first musical, Jerome Robbins' first musical, Betty Comden and Adolph Green's first musical. Um, <clears throat> Oliver Smith's first musical. Um, and they were all 25 years old and unknowingly influencing the future of musical theater. Um, <clears throat> On the Town is also fascinating because of the rapid pace in which it happened. Fancy Free premiered April 18, 1944. Writing for the musical On the Town began in June um, and continued through the summer while Bernstein was also traveling across the country because he was a big name now and he was being a guest conductor. <clears throat> Rehearsals began November 13th. They had a tryout December 15th and it premiered on Broadway December 28th, 1944. Six months. Hamilton took six years to write. <laughs> People work years on musicals. It's a, it's a big endeavor. Um, Jerome Robbins later said, how could we do that? We didn't know any better. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and On the Town is fascinating because of its context within musical theater. What else was playing at the time? Oklahoma, uh, premiered 1943. It was still going strong on Broadway. There was a musical called Sing Out Sweet Land, which was a folk song review. <clears throat> it opened the day before On the Town. And it's interesting to think about those three musicals, um, all such uh, very American scores, and yet so different from each other. Carousel opened a few months after On the Town. And uh, Irving Berlin's This is the Army, that would be a contemporaneous war-related musical, and yet also 
completely unlike it. So On the Town was incredibly different than much of what was happening on Broadway, and it must, must have seemed so fresh and exciting. Um, <clears throat> it's also fascinating because of the significance that dance played in the theatrical experience. As Bernstein himself put it in his program notes for th his three episodes from On the Town, I believe this is the first Broadway show to have as many as seven or eight dance episodes in the space of two acts, and as a result, the essence of the whole production is contained in these dances. And On the Town is simply fascinating because of the music itself. Um, what we now know is so characteristic of Bernstein, who was a, a dichotomous being in all things, was already evident in this first score. This combination of pop and serious, the fusion of high and low culture, this incorporation of ballet music with jazz and blues, opera with vaudeville, how different the score must have sounded at the time. <clears throat> this show is fascinating because of its context within American history. On the Town opened during World War II, and besides providing the subject matter for the book itself, the war certainly had an um, effect on nearly every aspect of the production. As an act of patriotism, every show opened with the national anthem. Stage manager Peggy Clark kept precise timing records for weeks and weeks, which we have in her collection. And you can see on this act one sheet for the 11th week, she includes the Star Spangled Banner right at the top, national anthem, for each performance. Um, because of her uh, relationship with the stage door canteen, Clark was in charge of performances the company would do specifically for servicemen or um, veteran hospitals. And there are several examples in her papers of what cast and crew members were needed, what props, how maybe they were gonna fit the musical just into one hour. And also um, several letters of thanks from different service organizations showing their deep appreciation for the time that the cast spent. <clears throat> we also have this letter she kept from Macy's and closed here with our samples of Macy's hose text leg, leg makeup for use by the cast and principals of On the Town. Since nylon was in such short supply during the war, you know, these are things that we don't think about today, but were very important to the production at the time. This show is fascinating because of the political statements it made. The creative team was very deliberate in choosing to have an integrated cast. And while the white press just ignored this in their reviews, it repeatedly got written about in the black press. This is from a February 17th, 1945 article in the African American newspaper, The People's Voice, written by Joe Bostick, titled, Democracy Comes to Broadway Theater. On the Town Proves the Point. Negroes Cast in Normal Roles. For the first time in the history of the big street, a mixed cast is completely integrated in a thoroughly normal presentation of people living their lives and having loads of fun doing it in New York. It's the biggest, most important thing that has ever happened to Negroes in the American theater. Six Negroes are in the cast, are cast not as Negro characters, but as New Yorkers, whom you'd never know were Negroes except for the color of their skin. And it goes on. It's, you should read the whole thing. It's over there on the table. Um, but also from the caption underneath the picture, once before in the WPA's Sing for Your Supper, there was complete integration. But until the current George Abbott opus came along, the policy has been to studiously separate the races, despite the fact that people live, work, and fight wars together. And the company also practiced what they silently preached. Um, they had mixed race dressing rooms at a time when that was just not done on Broadway. And halfway through the run, Everett Lee, who was a violinist in the otherwise all-white pit orchestra, was hired as the conductor and musical director, the first African-American to, to do so on Broadway. <clears throat> 
And while none of these six leads were portrayed by African Americans, one of the build stars was the Japanese American Sono Osato. She played the character of Miss Turnstiles, Ivy Smith, and in the earliest script we have, she's still sporadically um, referred to as Jane Smith. Um, she was a character that was described simultaneously as exotic and yet an all-American girl. This was a bold, subversive choice at a time when America was at war with Japan. And Osato's own father was interned by the US government. Um, in her memoir, Distant Dances, Osato wrote, it was amazing to me that at the height of a world war fought over the most vital political, moral, and racial issues, a Broadway musical should feature and have audience audiences unquestionably accept a half Japanese as an all-American girl. This is probably the most indelible impression I have had of the magic of the theater. I could never have been accepted as Ivy Smith in films or later on television. Only the power of illusion created between performers and audiences across the footlights can transcend political preference, moral attitudes, and racial prejudice. And <clears throat> it was also unheard of that a Japanese American woman could win the title of Miss Turnstiles, a contest that is clearly modeled after Miss America and Miss Subways, neither of which Osato could have uh, won in real life at that time. And that leads us to the fact that On the Town is fascinating because of its portrayal of gender and sexuality. Wartime America shifted the roles of women in society. And this was evident on the stage. Fancy Free was about three sailors. I think On the Town is about three independent women with jobs who are making their own way, who thrive in their comedic roles, who are very sexually aggressive, and are repeatedly given the last word. Wartime America shifted the roles of women in society, and this was evident off the stage as well. Peggy Clark, who would go on to revolutionize lighting design in the theater, was the lone woman in charge of a group of men running every detail backstage. And Betty Comden played a vital and indispensable role in the creative process. And her involvement undoubtedly had much to do with the fact that this show stood as an example of female empowerment. Looking at the earliest script, I found out that it nearly didn't, um, but we'll get back to that later. <clears throat> so now that I've given you a whole diatribe about why I find this show fascinating, I guess we should tell the story of how it came to be so fascinating. Uh, as is the case in almost every musical theater production, the show changed shape and evolved. The earliest version of the script we have is not in the Bernstein collection but it was a copyright deposit received by the library on August 1st, 1944. So that's um, a whole four months before the show premiered. This script, compared with later drafts and along with Bernstein's music manuscripts, give us insight into the show's development. Some numbers were pretty firm in their shape from the very beginning. Um, like Act 1, Scene 1, I feel like I'm not out of bed yet. The early copyright script includes lyrics that suggest a slightly different melody. <clears throat> and before it was sleep in my lady's arms, you can see at the very top of this sketch, um, it used to be sleep in Jesus's arms, which would be very difficult to sing. Um, New York, New York was also pretty firm in its shape. Um, and this is an important sketch we have over there on the table as well. And it shows that Bernstein himself was working on the lyric. And he was writing, New York, New York, a hell of a town. It picks you up, scratch, scratch, scratch. The speed is up, but the battery's down. And Liberty's dressed in her prettiest gown. Um, so you can see that's not the final version still. But originally, New York, New York only um, opened the show, and it was not uh, reprised at the end like it is in the final version. Um, <clears throat> uh, Come Up to My Place remained fairly the same. 
though it was called My Father Said, and it included some additional verses like, my mother told me with a frown, there's one thing that I mustn't do, but Papa told me where it was, so off to Minsky's Burley Q. <laughs> the Burley Q is through. For 40 cents, it didn't seem quite decent somehow. It costs 8.80 now. Um, and with I Can Cook Too, the music in there, it stayed almost exactly the same. Though it was originally sung directly after Come Up to My Place, out on the street in front of the Empire State Building. So they never made it up to, to Hildy's place. Some numbers change shape to a more varying degree. Uh, one of Gaby's big numbers, Lucky to Be Me, was originally a pop song that Bernstein had previously written called Nicest Time of Day. Morning sun tells me that the day's begun and your eyes reflect the golden ray. It's the nicest time of day. So he sought to make use of that song, and in its first incarnation in the show, he changed it to Nicest Time of Year. And you can tell it's him working on this lyric because it's not very good. <laughs> Winter time never was my favorite time. Winter brings sleep and snow and awful things. But my darling, if you're only near, it's the nicest time of year. Until eventually we get... What a day, fortune smiled and came my way, bringing love I never thought I'd see. I'm so lucky to be me. Which was no doubt an uplifting sentiment for people to hear a sailor sing during a wartime America. In the very first copyright script, there are lyrics for Pickup Song. Um, this song was cut by George Abbott, which upset Bernstein because he used motives from the melody uh, later in a ballet, and he didn't want to lose that continuity in the score. But it's since been restored, and um, you can hear it at the Olney Theater. Um, it's called Gaby's Coming Now, and you can see in this lyric, uh, it's not Gaby's coming to town, it's Gaby's come to town. A number that changed entirely was originally called The Picture of You sung by the three sailors upon their discovery of the Miss Turnstiles poster. And a lyric for that survives. All our lives we've been looking, looking, looking for a girl who is the picture of you. And now it's come true, delicious, capricious. You answer all our wishes. You're the picture of you. Champion at polo, at ballet, and knitting and singing solo, opera and shot put. You've given us a mental hot foot. <laughs> it's also described in there as a satirical song and dance number done by Ivy Smith, looking glamorous, and a group of boys, a couple in top hats, a naval officer, an army officer, a couple of arty looking fellows. She acts out the contradictory statements in the description of her in the subway ad as her admirers sing and whirl her about. At the end of the number, the audience has no more idea of what she is like than at the beginning. And so that song was clearly replaced by the presentation of Miss Turnstile's ballet. Um, the Carnegie Hall Pavan and the whole scenario of Ivy in her studio at the, uh, the voice lesson morphed in various ways. She was originally supposed to sing, I'm a Little Prairie Flower which was actually a popular song from the 1930s that was uh, performed by the British comedy duo, The Two Leslies. I don't know why they wanted to use that song. Uh, and in the scripts, the lyrics deviate from the original songs, whether that was purposeful or not, who knows. Um, but uh, I think it was a good choice to write original music in its place, using the elements of solfege, the do, re, do, making it believably pedagogical and while retaining their comedic intentions. One scenario that went through numerous iterations finally developed into the well-known Carried Away, sung by Claire and Ozzy and played by Comden and Green themselves. Um, in the very first version of the script, Claire and Ozzy, they go to the museum and uh, meet and uh, they have their slapstick comedy meeting there, similar to as we know it today. Uh, but upon telling Ozzy of her purely platonic relationships with men, she merely makes anthropological studies of them. 
Claire then sadly mentions she's had trouble in the past with romance and sings a song titled Another Love. And uh, we can see some evidence of that on this sketch um, here. And there's some lyrics. And so I've had another love, another dream, another spell. I thought that this time it was love, the diamond ring, the wedding bell, and so forth. Um, it, it's, a, it's a bluesy number, but then within the song, she starts getting overdramatic, which is her character, and so does Ozzy, which is his character. Um, and they start enacting out this comedic routine where they recall a primitive relationship they had back in 6 million BC, since they're surrounded by all these dinosaurs. And um, they sing a duet and describe what their love was like back in prehistoric time, apparently with a pet brontosaurus named Penelope. Then upon finishing that number, Claire and Ozzy then agree to go get a drink at a cafe where she forgets she is actually supposed to be meeting her fiance, Judge Pitkin, and then that whole running gag begins. The trio keep pouring drinks for each other, um, asking to say when, and uh, they all start getting a little inebriated. In the first version of the script, Say When is a duet. Um, I've looked at various sources. At some point, it was a solo for the character of Claire. In a, a script that Bernstein has, Carried Away is performed at the museum, while Say When is sung towards the end of Act One by Claire and Hildy, in counterpoint with Ozzy and Chip singing another song called I'm Afraid It's Love that also didn't get into the show. So it was tried out in these numerous incarnations until it was finally just cut. Um, but I would like to welcome our performers with the original song about being carried away, Say When. wonderful to hear something you've only seen on a page for the first time. Isn't that wonderful? Thank you so much. Um, there is a whole host of songs that we have limited or no extant material for, so there's not much information known about them. Um, but, but, oh, that was part of the lyrics that you just sang. Um, 
Bernstein had this song list, and looking at it gives us some insight into just how many different numbers were being considered, and this isn't even a comprehensive list. I know of others that didn't make it on here. Um, so you can see on the right side, he had songs that he had on hand uh, that includes The Familiar Got Me, I Can Cook Too, and New York, New York. It also includes Another Love, Say When, and Nicest Time, which we discussed earlier. Um, a song I know nothing about, even though he had it on hand, uh, called Gaby, which was apparently sung by Ivy. Also, um, Where Are You, which there is evidence of on this sketch here. Um, where are you? How can? When will? I know. Lovely vision that I've loved and waited for. Am I just chasing a dream or will... <laughs> Remember, scratch, 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 scratch. Uh, or will it be a dream come true? Um, also included on that list was It's Gotta Be Bad to Be Good and Ain't Got No Tears Left, which were both part of the nightclub sequence, uh, but were ultimately replaced. And then we see a song, uh, a list of songs he has remaining, including Pitkin's I Understand, the Passa Outa which was also cut from the conga cabana portion of the nightclub sequence, and you can guess what that's about. Um, a song called Give Me Room. It appears in the original script to be sung by a claustrophobic Hildy as she and Chip ride up a crowded elevator to the top of the Empire State Building. The elevator starts. Hildy sings a song expressing a yearning for space a loud rhythm song which works into a dance with everyone dancing crowded into the tiny space. At the top, everyone gets out, leaving Chip and Hildy, Hildy dancing madly. At the jolt of stopping, they fall on the floor. But that's all that I know that survives from that song. Um, then Bernstein lists the same songs, but he divides them into categories according to their specialty. They are either sweet, hot, or blue. And then finally, down there at the bottom, uh, we have a divided list of numbers. Uh, what is listed there as Boulevardier is in the original script is in the original script as Cocktails for Me, which opens the cafe scene where Claire and Ozzy sing "Say When." So I guess there was a lot of songs about drinking. <laughs> the description in the script reads. A number concerning the last of the boulevardiers. This is the only place left for them to boulevard at, and they'll keep at it no matter what happens. They'll sing, they sing a lilting waltz refrain. Obviously, it didn't further the plot in any way, so it was cut, and the whole scene was moved to Claire's apartment eventually. Um, on that list is intermission. This opens the scene at the theater where Gaby comes to find Ivy and ask her on a date again that evening. From the original script, the intermission crowd comes pouring out, pushing Gaby to the side. There is a satirical song by the chorus of theater goers. I don't know how the show is, but the intermission's great. <laughs> During this number, the crowd is divided into three general groups one of which enthusiastically shouts its praise of the play they are witnessing. The second screams equally enthusiastically of its utter worthlessness. And the third pipes feebly its indecision as to the play's merits. Um, that number wasn't cut until the Boston tryout at some point. Okay, you can see it on the program. <clears throat> then on that list is a song titled British Troops. Uh, originally closing out the first act was a number sung by the five leads, minus Ivy, meeting up in Times Square for their evening out. They look up and they notice the news ticker, and they read, British troops fight victorious engagement. An interesting injection of wartime reality in mid-show. But they start reading all the news on the ticker out loud, exaggeratedly slow. <laughs> and then use that as fodder to break out into song. Um, 
So the music begins. The five start the nonsense song of reading the time sign. The crowd passing picks up the song. As they sing, the five principals walk out into the street. And as the song builds, we see Ivy Smith coming through the crowd into Nettics. She looks around, hoping to find Gaby, but he has just left. Dejected, dejected, as the music builds, she turns to leave. The five have meantime wandered into a photographer's next door and are posing inside cutouts, which has its back to the audience. Ivy leaves sadly, as in the photographer's shop, the five are posing. The photographer calls, one, two, three. The music is wild, a blackout. The curtain comes down, showing the five on the picture that was just taken with all of them wearing their characteristic facial expressions and posing in outlandish cutouts. Gaby is a mermaid, alone on a rock. Ozzie and Claire are little boy and girl sitting inside a crib. <laughs> Chip is inside a big pot, being cooked by Hildy in a cannibal cutout, stirring the pot. This idea was clearly abandoned in favor of the Times Square Ballet, and I think we should all be thankful that it was. Uh, and then the last song on that list is Give with the Gavel, uh, which takes place in the final scene of the show. Um, and perhaps what changed most dramatically was the ending of the show. The original script ends as it began, with the three couples on a trial in a night court. Um, and this book ends all of the action in between as a flashback. And uh, George Abbott kind of famously, that was a deal breaker for him. He said, cut the flashback or I'm not doing the show. This element, um, um, almost the entire scene is musicalized, so it's much in the style of an operetta. Uh, but I don't know what the music is, but we have the script for it. And it says it's musicalized. Um, Judge Pickin. Bridgework is presiding, and a crowd of people are urging him to bring justice down on these three couples. Give with the gavel, make with the mallet, they're trapped, and justice shall be done. In prison they'll be clapped, they've had their sinful fun, and so forth. Pitkin, the judge, dismisses the three sailors to go back to their ship to face judgment from the Navy. So that leaves the three ladies left alone to defend for themselves, and they band together singing, never underestimate the power of a woman. Now, given the very forward nature and the strong impression of the female characters that have been given throughout the show, on my first read, I was very excited about that song. I was excited about its potential. But then I read on. Let's see. Never underestimate, oh, that's the give with the gavel part. Nope. Never underestimate the power of a woman. A woman has three weapons that a man must fear. Hildy says, the tongue, threateningly. Claire says, the torso, wiggling. Ivy says, the tear, crying. The three women reprise their um, associated songs they had sung earlier in the show and in turn try to win over the judge and I would like to invite our performers back up here. And first, Hildy tries. She speaks first, she says. Oh, or actually, wait, she, she's, I'm gonna speak the song, the part that we yes. don't um, have the music to. In three minutes flat, we'll be out of here. Listen to me while I chew off his ear. Oh, we're gonna hold it. <laughs> Listen, I promise it's going to be great. <laughs> yeah, here's the, here's the dialogue again. In three minutes flat, we'll be out of here. Listen to me while I chew off his ear. Oh, you're a bum judge on top of the rest. I'll scream it all over the town. You're such a bum judge. We're under arrest. And just because love let you down, you're a perfect heel, a banana peel, a balloon that is filled with gas. You're an A1 chump, an Andy Gump. Brother, you're a bit of an ass. But if you free us, we won't raise a fuss. We won't even bear you a grudge. We'll Never under
underestimate the power of the torso. Well, she wiggles. The tongue, all right, but the torso's more so. Oh, judge, you look as lofty as an eagle. Up there, you're so impressive and so regal. Come down and let's not be so legal. Oh, judge, oh, judge, you've got such wisdom and such vision. I'll let you see if you'll change your decision. My appendectomy incision, oh, judge. Somehow, neither of those methods convinced the judge, so then Ivy, Miss Turnstile, steps up and she just cries while um, Nicest Time of Year, AKA Lucky to Be Me, plays. This, Pitkin cannot deal with. He gives in, and the girls are free to go to their fellas at the boat and bo uh, bid them farewell. So unfortunately, after everything that had transpired, the three female leads are getting together and saying a woman can get what she wants by talking her way, using her body, or if all else fails, crying. Can you even imagine? <laughs> Fortunately, the creative team realized how incongruous this ending was with the environment they had created and the story they were telling, and they changed the ending. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, in Bernstein's version of the script, there is still a trial, though it's not a flashback. Uh, the show then ends with the sextet singing a song called Dream With Me. Dream with me tonight and let tonight be ours. No matter where we chance to be, we're together if we dream. And though we may be far apart, keep me in your heart and dream with me. I can't say when Bernstein wrote this, whether it was specifically for On the Town or if it was one of his pre-existing songs. Um, I, I don't know. But in any case, it was cut. And it is not listed in the, even in the Boston program. But in true Bernstein fashion, he later attempted to use the song again in the 1950 musical Peter Pan. <laughs> but it was cut from that too. <laughs> uh, but it's occasionally performed and you can find versions of it online. Um, so now in the final version we are familiar with, Pitkin sings I Understand to Lucy Schmieler. Gaby runs off to find Ivy in Coney Island, and the two couples, Claire and Ozzy and Hildy and Chip, run after Gaby, and they perform the very well-known Some Other Time. This number was famously added during the tryout. Betty Comden recalled, This one we had to write in Boston, writing most of the night. We were in the window of a music store, because that was the only place we could find a piano we could use. <laughs> We needed a special song, and we found it there in the window in the middle of the night. Uh, therefore, due to the nature in which it was written, we don't have uh, the usual you know, pre-publication, the sketches in Bernstein's hand that we do for some of the other numbers. Um, but you, you can see this is a publisher's proof, and it says special rush at the top because it was being prepared after all of the other songs had already gone to publication. But there was, with all the um, publication material from Warner Chapel, there was a Bernstein holograph manuscript. And so I'm fairly certain that this is the first time this manuscript will ever be on display. So it's out there on the table today. Um, so then after the serious reprieve of some other time, Gaby finds Ivy, and the iconic New York, New York is reprised as the, th the three sailors return to their ship and the new sailors come ashore. And that is the final version of the final scene. Um, there is so much more I could talk about that we don't have time for today. Um, but I hope you find the show as fascinating as I do. Um, I hope you go see it if you're local at the only theater this summer. Um, and if you want to delve more into the subject matter yourself, Please come over and take a look at the material, come back to the library, um, and let's give a wonderful thanks 
to the performers who are here today who bring this music to life.